Good afternoon. I'm, st I'm still the same person I was this morning, but I did want to introduce uh, uh, Sadir Palais and T Ted Hopwood. Probably a lot of you may know Ted Hopwood and, and possibly Sadir also, but um, Sadir and Ted have worked with me on all of this, uh, all the information, actually the stuff this morning too. Um, I want to go ahead and I have this information with me, so if you want to obtain it later, that's fine. You might not have time to write it down now. But um, everything that I'm going to tell you this afternoon is actually the result of two research studies uh, done for the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. The reports for these two studies have been uh, written, final, and edited, and are in the process of being published, and they'll probably be available in the next week or two. They, they may not be available at this moment, but they will be soon. And one of them was thin film concrete coatings, uh, the KTC 1603, and the other one is chloride and contamination remediation on steel bridges, KTC 1608. And if, like I said, if you want to obtain those, res those reports, you can uh, catch me later and I'll uh, have this information again. Um, Ed had asked me to, this, like I said, this is two different research studies and, uh, and I was, had been working on putting some information together for each of them. And, uh, and Ed asked me to combine them into one. So we're going to, again, zip through things pretty quickly uh, and, and there'll be a, a lot of information in the reports that are not in this presentation. But first, let's talk about the uh, concrete coatings. Uh, as many of you are probably aware, or maybe all of you are aware, there's uh, action levels for the amount of chlorides in the concrete for steel reinforced concrete that uh, affect the corrosion of that steel. If you reach or exceed 0.03% chlorides by weight of concrete, you initiate corrosion in the steel. If you uh, exceed 0 0.08, you're accelerating corrosion, and if you get to 0 0.18, you're you've probably getting some severe section loss, a lot of corrosion product on your reinforcing steel. I say that to say this. In 2002, the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet uh, sampled some 12 to 15 bridges in central Kentucky in the sort of uh, Cincinnati, Ohio, Lexington, Kentucky, Louisville, Kentucky triangle and uh, and took powder samples of the bridge decks at the upper mat level, reinforcing mat. And in none of them did they reach more than 0.01% chlorides. So they dismissed chlorides in the bridge decks as, as inconsequential. But in continuing to, to maintain those bridge decks over the succeeding nine years, they they determined that there was something going on and they wanted, they asked the Kentucky Transportation Center at the University of Kentucky to go back and, and reassess this. So in the same geographic area, we looked at, at more like 40 bridges and we looked at not only the bridge decks, but the, uh, the substructures and the pier caps and uh, abutment seats. And what we found that was in nine years, we had gone from negligible amounts of chloride at the upper mat level to 0.2 to 0.3 percent in many cases in the decks and in 0.3 to 0.4 percent in many cases on pier seats on pier caps and abutment seats obviously a lot of chlorides had intruded to concrete in that 10-year period now it's interesting that in the late 90s is when uh, 98 somewhere in that range probably when kentucky really began uh, increasing their de-icing uh, efforts, road, clear roads policies, and and I guess by the time uh, those were sampled in 2002, it, it just hadn't had time to penetrate as much. As we continued to pour salts on them, obviously a lot of those salts have uh, have penetrated into the concrete, and and what happens when that happens? Well, I'm sure these are familiar to a lot of you. Uh, this is a a pier cap here. You can see that the uh, Concrete has completely spalled away. Likewise here. Actually, pardon? No, no, for a lot of it had no cover. Well, no, I mean, it, it had sufficient cover, I think, initially, but, but uh, uh, once, once the uh, chlorides get to that steel, uh, it'll, it'll pop any amount of concrete off there. 
This is actually a, a, a site where Interstate 65 goes through Louisville. There's a, uh, there's a number of, uh, there's 30 some bridges, 20 some of them are steel. And, uh, and we were down looking at some of those. This is a location where uh, people that lived in the area came out when Ted and I was down looking at them and, and was sort of you know, upset with us and wanted to know when we were gonna do something because their kids like to play underneath these bridges sometimes. And it was, it was unsafe for them, and no doubt. Actually, in, in another location where the I-65 approaches the Ohio River, the uh, from the ground to the bottom of the uh, to the, of the steel is 40 some feet, so the pier caps are 40 plus feet, and uh, and I'll park there doing some inspections. A chunk of concrete, probably weighing 40 pounds off, fell from 40 something feet and and shattered on the pavement, you know, 10 feet from my vehicle. Uh, it's it it would be unsafe, absolutely. And you know, this is one of the things that a lot of our bridge designers have decided, you know, 20 or 30 years ago, we're going to get away from concrete, uh, get away from steel, and do more concrete. And we've we've hidden problems for some time, but they're those chickens are coming home to roost. So, what the cabinet asked us to do was to look at some uh, potential thin film coatings to protect this concrete. Uh, at least new concrete or that which is not too laden with chlorides at this point from additional chlorides. They wanted, much like I was talking about the beam end treatments this morning, they wanted systems that were going to be probably applied just to uh, problem areas underneath leaky joints and maybe some fascias, but, uh, but primarily would be applied by state forces, which again would, would not be experts in surface preparation and coatings application, but things that were relatively easy to use and, and you could put on relatively quickly. And as part of that, we were to do both a field application and uh, laboratory evaluation. And in the laboratory, we did salt ponding tests and also uh, ASTMD 4587, which is the uh, ultraviolet condensation weathering uh, protocol, and then we evaluated various performance. The performance in particular that we were looking at was first of all adhesion of these thin film coatings to the concrete substrate and the resistance of those coatings to chloride transmission. Secondly, well thirdly and fourthly I guess, we, was also color stability and, and gloss retention. And, and I'm sure some of the, the coatings people in the, in the audience would tell you, those might not be directly relatable to the performance of the coating as in, in its adhesive strength or its chloride, uh, its ability to block the chlorides. But what they do tell you is, is if something's happening with your coating, it's, it's the degradation of the coating that's, that's beginning. Um, we looked at eight coatings. I, put these in red, the, the, the coating system number four in red simply because it was applied in the field, was not applied in the lab because the, the supplier for that coating, once we had obtained it and began to do our work, insisted that uh, that was a 24-hour cure between the prime and the second coat. And that was one of the criteria we had initially established that, that we didn't realize that his coating needed that and we, we didn't want something that necessitated a minimum of a 24-hour cure. Now, some of these others probably went overnight simply due to the cured, you know, conditions and when they were applied in the day, but they didn't require necessarily a 24-hour cure. And then <clears throat> I just wanted to, these three coating systems that are blue, and I am from Kentucky, so everything good is blue, and, <laughs> and, and so I colored them blue. And just remember, as we go on through this, these three systems are blue, but if you look at these three systems, they're all two coat systems with an epoxy primer and then either a urethane or acrylic top coat. Generally speaking, under good conditions, though, those, that second coat can be applied in the same day. The application in the field and in the lab was by roller primarily. Again, we're not taking a lot of exotic equipment of any kind. I don't know that a paint sprayer is exotic, but, but our state crews probably don't have them in all cases. So we're going to apply them by roller. And I wanted to point out too, you'll see the two white spots uh, down on the, uh, yeah, the two white spots down here. Uh, 
anytime we had a large divot in the concrete, uh, we would b take a brush and, and get some paint in that. But the rest of it was just roller applied. For example, here, where there was some steel close to the surface, and it had uh, corroded and popped the concrete off, that had a brush. Probably this spot had a brush and this one. But the one thing I did want to point out here is that we made no attempt, and this was one of the things we we're talking about, the user-friendly coatings. We didn't want our crews to have to go out there and fight with pinholes. So it's, it's sort of a measure of how easy your coating is to apply uh, if you don't have a lot of pinholes in it, <clears throat> and we weren't going to take a lot of effort to repair them. And you can see in here, it's sort of tough to see when we're at this angle, but there's some, there's some areas in here that had pinholes. And in fact, this is the salt ponding block that was cast in the lab. And as you can see, there's a fair number of pinholes in it. I understand that that will allow, you know, the, the salt water a path into the concrete, but our assumption was if it's, if it doesn't apply easily and wet easily and fill these up in the field, it's probably not going to happen anyway. So we want to know how your coatings perform with the type of application that it's likely to get. After the, uh, that was a salt ponding block that I showed you, but we also applied coatings to panels. Those panels then were subjected to the UV condensation uh, exposure for 3,000 hours. After the coatings had cured, we uh, measured direct att uh, tension adhesion on them. And as you can see, most of them, we had uh, reasonable values. Uh, th that much adhesion is, is going to keep your coating on your concrete. And as you can see, all of them increased with time in the exposure to the UV and the condensation. So the adhesion for all of them is good enough. System 8 may be a little bit problematic, but, but all of them end up being fairly tight coatings. This is the coating adhesion in the field. It was tested after six months. And uh, again, same sort of numbers, 500 to 1500 PSI, all of them enough adhesion. Uh, chloride, the salt ponding blocks um, went through the, uh, the test protocol. And then each block had three, uh, three locations where powder samples were taken and combined and evaluate for, for chloride contents at a half inch depth and one inch depth. And as you can see here, system zero over here is a control. No coatings, just, just bare concrete. And as you can also see, systems three, five, and seven really didn't do much for retarding chlorides. Systems one, two, and six did a pretty good job. The uh, change in color, again, it's an indication that something is going on with your coating. And, and all of these, the first seven are pretty good. Not, a, not huge changes. But system eight, again, we had a huge change from its initial condition to the 1,000 hours and the 2,000, 3,000 hours. So it, it changed a lot. Gloss reading, again, is an indication as your coating starts to break down, you're going to get down glossing typically. Again, system eight performed pretty pretty poorly, and the rest of them not so bad. System two had a bit of change, but even though like system number five had a, you know, a fair amount of change, it started, well, it mostly started high. It looks, it looks like there's something going on there, but it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that, uh, it didn't change as much as, it, as you might first think. So it, uh, it, didn't, it didn't perform poorly in that. So quickly from the conclusions from this is that first of all adhesions and the ability to resist chloride are two important characteristics for concrete coating performance systems one two and eight performed better than the other systems in, in those performance criteria and each of those systems that performed better one two and six all of them are two coat systems each of them has an epoxy primer two of them have urethane top coats and the third has an acrylic top coat. Okay, this the concrete. Now, again, the uh, transportation cabinet, uh, looking at their maintenance painting program over the years, we talked about that briefly, uh, maybe this morning, or at least with some of you I was, we were visiting, is when we go out and do a maintenance painting project, uh, we, if we do a good blast and application, we should be getting uh, a long time, we should be getting 30 years of service or more out of it, but we don't. 
Uh, matter of fact, a, a lot of people expect maybe 20 years out of their maintenance painting projects. When we start talking about bridges lasting 100 years, that's too many painting cycles. So we have to have things that, coating systems that last longer. So the Trans uh, Kentucky Transportation Cabinet asked us, because we had seen over the years that you can go out and do it, what we're currently in our specs are a good job, but, but in, in a few years, you'll have breakdown of a zinc primer three coat system in these problem areas. And it's areas where you know you have chlorides, you have pitting and chlorides. So <clears throat> we were asked to, to look at surface preparation and make recommendations on the most effective way of preparing the surfaces in regard to the remediation of chlorides. Because we've done some previous work for the cabinet at the University of Kentucky, and what we've seen is that the distribution of chlorides on a, on a steel surface is what's key, more so than the amount of chlorides, because you can, I mean, we've seen you can take fairly high levels of chlorides if they're evenly distributed on a panel, and you can still get some pretty good performance. You can take lower levels if you don't know the distribution, and you can get poor performance of your protective coatings. So. And in order to try to replicate what happens in the field, we didn't charge panels. We've actually put them in uh, ASTM B117 salt fog for 2,000 hours to reproduce or replicate that pitted, rough, contaminated surface that we find in the field. And then we cleaned those corroded steel panels with a number of uh, surface preparation methods. We assessed the retained chlorides and then made recommendations to the transportation cabinet on what surface preparation they should probably best use. These are the uh, four by six steel panels. The uh, mill scale has been ground off of them and they're in a uh, salt fog chamber. This is after 2,000 hours. You can see the uh, corrosion product and the salts that are deposited on them. I think actually we measured some of these at uh, uh, without disturbing anything, which wouldn't happen in the field. It gets washed off, brushed off, uh, debris knocks it off or whatever in the field. But actually, I think there was like two grams of, of chlorides per square centimeter here. There's a lot. And after 2,000 hours, they were all uh, cleaned by wire brush just to get a constant cleanliness on them. As you can see here, the underside of this panel uh, has not been cleaned at this point. There's still the deposits, but the top side has been wire brushed. And what we found after wire brushing this 100 or so samples is that the, the surface roughness on them, there was, there was pitting that was in the 20 mil, sometimes uh, more than that range. So it was a moderately rough surface. Maybe not as rough as some of the field conditions, but in that range. And it also, the average chloride content on these after SP2 cleaning was 500 micrograms per square centimeter of salt. That sounds like a lot, but we've actually measured 450 micrograms per square centimeter of salt on bottom flanges of bridge beams late in the winter, early spring, before it's been flushed off a lot. So uh, de-icing work can, can put a lot of salt in your system. Now, those uh, four by six panels that we were looking at earlier, uh, what we wanted to do was to take each one of those panels. We, we randomly selected three panels for each surface preparation method. And after this uh, uh, exposure to the salt fog and then cleaning by uh, wire brush, a one inch strip of it was clipped off for evaluation for chloride contents. That's where I got that average of 500 micrograms per square centimeter through boiling extraction of those pieces of steel. And then after, after that, they were subjected, after clipping that one inch off, then they were subjected to the various surface preparation methods. As you can see, two other, after the surface preparation, it was divided again. One of them for uh, analysis by scanning electron microscope for this one inch slab, and then this four by four piece, again, was boiling extraction to measure the quantities of chlorides. Uh, these are, were one set of panels, three panels, that was going to have a particular surface preparation method. Uh, you can see where the three pieces are, are clipped off and they're in boiling extraction. At this point then, we've, we've selected 32 candidate surface preparation methods. Eight of them were dry, which is combinations of different types of abrasive media, it'd be steel grid or mineral slag, glass, aluminum oxide. Abrasive, abrasive size, we could have 40 fix 50 mix, a 40, 50, 120 mix. 
and then re-blasting, which means uh, uh, blasting it to an SP10 condition, letting it flash rust, blast it again. And then we actually, in some cases, did that another time, and then in some cases, yet another. So one, some of them had three blasts, uh, some of them one. And of the 24 wet methods, there were combinations of water pressure, water abrasive mixes, uh, water temperature, and chemical additives. After the dry methods, this is the typical uh, surface that we were looking at, an SP10. After the wet methods, the typical surface cleanliness was a, a WJ1. After they were cleaned to these conditions, they were clipped again, and the one-inch clip was taken to a scanning electron microscope. Um, during the time we were actually doing the work, uh, this thing is closed up. And after they were done with it, I'll ask them to take one piece of metal and put back in there. I just wanted to point to say one thing here is that time in the scanning electron microscope is it takes a lot of time, and you, we can't do a hundred samples on every square centimeter of the surface. So what we did on these is, is the first three we scanned the entire surface on both sides. What we found was that the distribution of chlorides in that was uh, consistent. There wasn't edge effects. So, and, and, but we took days doing those three. So we went back and actually just chose three areas on one side of each one, and we would uh, analyze an area on, on each end and in the middle. And what we had seen from the first three was that was uh, representative of, of the entire piece of metal. After, this, uh, after the piece was cut off and were taken to the scanning electron microscope, the remaining four by four piece then was uh, subjected to boiling extraction to measure the remaining chlorides, just quantity. Due to the variability of the initial chloride content, we weren't happy with just saying total remaining chlorides at the end of the surface prep. We wanted to know how effective that method had been. So we were measuring the percentage based on the initial amount of chlorides, the percentage remaining or percentage removed. As you can see here, wet methods tend to be maybe a little bit more effective, but um, the th there's three wet methods at the beginning and they all involved water and abrasives. And that were the most effective, but they only got us down. The lowest we got was about five and a half micrograms per square centimeter. But on the dry methods, what we did find was that two of them, and these happened to be the blast and reblast, and then the blast and reblast twice, uh, were significantly better than the others. And I think it's interesting that most of us probably, I know in Kentucky for years, if we're going to do an abrasive blast job, we always abrasive blast with a 40-50 mix to an SP10 condition. That's this one. The worst thing that we could do as far as chlorides is concerned. This is just the total remaining chlorides. Uh, you know, five and a half uh, is about as low as we got. In some cases up to 24, that, that uh, just dry abrasive blast. And somebody asked me the question earlier about what, how, many, how much chloride is acceptable. And, and my answer would be zero because we can't identify through our normal methods how they're distributed. And here's why. This is a scanning electron microscope view of a 73 mil by 59 mil piece of one of those panels. After surface preparation, this method yielded 6.4 uh, micrograms per square centimeter of chlorides, 99.1 effective. But as you can see here, what, what we did in doing this scanning electron microscope is as the electron beam excites this surface and it, it's measuring what elements are coming out, what it sees there, and, and we told it to color chlorine in red. So the experts, which I am certainly not, tell me that a lot of this paler red is like backscatter. Uh, if you ran the test long enough, that would go away. But these hot spots are actual salt deposits. And as you can see, this one is 4.7 mils across. So we, we've got, what, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight or nine spots of salt in this area that we're looking at. 
I got a few of these because they look a little bit different, and there was a, one particular phenomenon that we noticed that we were thought was interesting, not that we can explain everything. As you can see here, there's far fewer deposits of chlorides, but it's got 10.3 micrograms per square centimeter of chlorides. The area of the deposit here of this one is just a little over two thousandths of an inch in diameter. We also observed in some of those uh, clumping. As you can see here, we got relatively larger maybe. You know, this is 3.6 mils, but um, most of them are grouped together. And in some cases, that's even more the case. Or around the outside of this image, very little chloride, but in the middle, a bunch of very small deposits of chlorides. So here is another clumping. So what we're saying here is that as long as you can measure chlorides even down to five micrograms per square centimeter, which most people would tell you is, is, is plenty sufficient to put coatings over, your chlorides, and we've seen this in the past in the lab, is that even at low levels you can get early coatings failure, and it's because your chlorides are concentrated. It's like if you had a 15-inch pizza and a single grain of salt in the middle of it, but it's enough salt, it's salty enough to salt the whole thing. But uh, uh, it's all focused in that one spot. You'll get a corrosion cell there, and then it'll grow. So our conclusion from this First of all, our recommendation to the cabinet was, unless you want to start uh, employing wet methods and dry methods together, which complicates your, your waste handling or your residue handling, um, it, it, it makes longer time on the project. The best thing you can do is at, this, at this time is blast to an SP-10, let it flash, and blast it again. That's not new. Uh, people have found that 20 years ago, probably, and we just reproved it for the Kentucky Transportation Cabinet. Wet surface methods are the most effective in removing chlorides, but repeated dry blasting is nearly as effective and it's much easier to deal with. And no method tested cleaned to less than five micrograms per square centimeter, which is not sufficient with the distribution that we've seen. Those remaining chloride deposited in hot spots, and what we've seen is you will have coatings failures in most likely in those hot spots. Any questions? Did you try a combination of after you did your double blast, then do a wash? I don't. No, I don't think so. I don't, we had some where we had a pre-wash. Uh, we would use the chemical additives and we would pre-wash the surface and then let it dry and blast it off. Uh, did we do one where we dry brace of blasted and then washed it? I can't remember. I don't think so off the top of my head. I really wanted to put those 32 methods, but each one needs a short paragraph to describe it, exactly how we perform the work, and, and that would be a presentation in its own. Because uh, most of the, of the time in the field, what I see is I see they'll do a wash first, get rid of all the bird droppings uh, and, and, and at the same time remove the salts and then do their blast. And, um, and then it, what you're saying is, is then let it flash rust and then blast it again and you should get your chlorides down to a manageable level. Right? What's, man what's manageable? Well, five micrograms or, <laughs> yeah. And, and so, so um, if it's one microgram and it's deposited in one spot, it's a, it's still a problem. Well, that, that's why I was thinking maybe a, a, a final a wash after that might, you know, since since salts are so hydroscopic, you know, maybe the water would would do it. Anyways, and that's one of the things that we could have gotten more and more complicated, but it's not going to happen in the field that we're going to pre-wash and dry dry blast of blast and then post-wash. I just I don't see it happening. Okay, we take uh, one more question here. Thank you. That was a well done presentation. I got to see the SEM I always talk about. Um, I think we should put on our research project nominations helping you do sulfate also. Because a lot of times in the field, I see nothing with chloride, but it's the sulfate, a high level of 20 micrograms per square centimeter. So sulfate should be our next target. 
and that should be on the little happy list we did this morning for project names, I think. In Kentucky, we have actually looked at soluble salts. We've looked at nitrates, sulfates, chlorides. 99% of what we see is chlorides. There, there have been some, some hits on, on uh, nitrates in particular, but, uh, but far fewer. If we can handle chlorides, we've got a big, big, big head start on it. Yeah. Okay.